In the 21st century, we have all become familiar with high-tech weapons of war. Smart bombs, stealth technology, concentrated firepower, knockout blows. But the weapons used in war today all have their origins in the conflicts of previous centuries. Throughout history, victory in battle has gone to the side that can combine human courage, the heroism of the common soldier, with superior technology. Battle Stations is a series about technology in war and about the men who flew the planes, crewed the tanks, sailed the ships, or drove the machines that made a real difference on the battlefield. Each battle station's program begins with a problem, the need to develop a faster fighter aircraft. The need to build a tank with more armor and more firepower. The need for a boat that can go onto the land. A plane that is invisible to the enemy, or a helicopter that can survive a shoot down. So each program begins with the planners, whose revolutionary designs can win wars. But at the core of each program is the machine itself. The device that, when operated well by trained men, can be the difference between defeat and victory. And what sensational changes in the technology of war there have been in the last hundred years. When the First World War began, powered flight was barely 10 years old. But in four dramatic years, aviation would advance in leaps and bounds. In 1914, aircraft could only fly at a speed of 80 miles an hour. By the end of the war, planes were flying at nearly double that speed. In 1914, bombs had to be thrown by hand over the side of an aircraft. By 1918, heavy biplanes could carry 1,500 pounds of bombs and release them right over their target. In 1914, many experts still expected the cavalry to carry the day. By the end of the war, giant 29-ton tanks and fighting vehicles dominated the battlefield. One German general attributed his country's defeat in the autumn of 1918 to the superior Allied use of tanks. At sea, vast steel battleships were still thought to rule the oceans. But already, submarines and aircraft were beginning a process of change that would transform the nature of naval warfare. In the Second World War, the changes were even more marked. The Spitfire was the first aircraft the RAF had that could fly at 300 miles an hour. Without it, the RAF would have been hard-pressed to withstand the Luftwaffe bombers in the summer of 1940. And the Battle of Britain could have turned out very differently.
the P-51 Mustang, when powered by the Packard Merlin engine, could fly at nearly 450 miles an hour. And it had the range to fly as far as Berlin to accompany the bombers. When Goering saw the American fighters over the German capital, he was amazed and declared, the jig is up. Against advanced technology like this, for him, the war was over. But the Germans still had some aces to play. The ME-262 was the first jet aircraft to fly in combat and into the history books. When the Allied pilots first saw the blur of the ME-262 past them, flying 100 miles an hour faster than the fastest Allied aircraft, they thought nothing could ever beat it. Then came the terrifying V-1 flying rocket, known as the Buzz Bomb. It was designed by one of Germany's most brilliant scientists, Werner von Braun. Londoners still recall with trembling the sound of the V-1's engines cutting out, soon to be followed by the mighty bang as this early form of cruise missile crashed to the ground, bringing chaos and horror. Although they came over England at 400 miles an hour, they could be shot down or intercepted. But what came next could never be shot down. On 3rd of October, 1942, the first A-4 rocket fired from the island research station of Pinemunda in the Baltic was launched successfully into the stratosphere. This was the first ballistic missile, and a new era was born, the Space Age. Later, in the form of the V-2, hundreds of these missiles, each loaded with a ton of high explosive, would be fired at London, bringing death and destruction on a massive scale. The ballistic missile was yet again a technological answer to a wartime problem. How to send explosives to an enemy city in a way that could not be stopped. Again, it was the German rocket scientist, Werner von Braun, who came up with the answer. And indeed, the V-2 rockets could not be stopped. No one could even hear them coming. The first you'd know was the sound of a huge explosion. And if you were unlucky enough to be underneath one, you would probably know nothing. All of these machines, from the Spitfire to Hitler's vengeance weapons, from the Mustang to the ME-262, have Battle Station's episodes devoted to them. But if the fighter pilots of World War II thought they were fighting at high speed, it was nothing to what would follow for the next generation of top guns. The era of the jet had well and truly arrived, and it was not long before the sound barrier was broken. By the time of the Korean War, at the beginning of the 1950s, the Soviet-made MiG-15 jet seemed to be the master of the skies. Where it flew, it carved a pathway that others avoided. It was called MiG Alley. But even the MiG, with its fantastic handling qualities, met its match when the F-86 Sabre arrived in Korea. Aerial dogfights were now supersonic. They were over in fractions of a second, as jets confronted each other 
at joint speeds of more than 1,200 miles an hour. Pilots needed fantastically quick reaction times. And before long, the Sabre won back control of the skies. By the end of the war, it was claimed that the Sabre had a kill ratio of 10 to 1. 10 losses inflicted on enemy aircraft for every single loss suffered itself. And by the end of the century, a new generation of jet aircraft was achieving even greater feats. The F-18 Hornet is a carrier-based aircraft that gives the US Navy an overwhelming advantage over its enemies. The US Marines, too, fly this magnificent combat aircraft. And when it's flying in formation, the American Blue Angels team fly at high speed, but in perfect formation, and only 24 inches apart from wingtip to wingtip. Only the most sophisticated onboard computer avionics can make such superb flying possible. The F-15 Eagle also combines the latest technologies with heads-up displays reflected on the windscreen so the pilot never has to look down to his controls. And a HOTAS main control stick with all the essential buttons and switches beneath the pilot's fingertips so that he never has to let go of the controls for a second. All this along with superb new Pratt & Whitney engines, enable the F-15 to fly to a height of 29,000 feet, the height of Everest, in only 60 seconds. With a series of kills recorded against Iraqi pilots in the Gulf War, many of whom never even knew what hit them, the F-15 now has the ultimate fear factor. In the war in 2003, Saddam Hussein's pilots didn't even fly if they knew the F-15 Super Eagle was up there. But still holding the speed record, the SR-71 Lockheed Blackbird could fly at Mach 3. That's three times the speed of sound. Flying at 90,000 feet at this incredible speed Nothing could catch the Blackbird as it soared high above enemy territory. But the Blackbird was a reconnaissance aircraft, and its task was to photograph, not bomb, what lay below. The Blackbird could photograph an area of 100,000 square miles in just 60 minutes. The MiG-15 and the F-86, the Hornet, the Eagle and the Blackbird, all have Battle Stations episodes about them. Vietnam was often called the first helicopter war. The Belle Huey became the iconic symbol of that war, and the Huey was the helicopter that could be a troop carrier, a gun platform, or a life saver. After Vietnam, the Sikorsky Company developed the Black Hawk designed to be robust enough to survive a crash landing. But in Mogadishu, in 1993, with a Black Hawk down, a raid that should have been over in an hour turned into a 12-hour nightmare for America. Battle stations 
tells the story of both of these fighting helicopters and the men who flew in them and who survived some extraordinary moments. Going back in time to the 1930s, civil aviation was just beginning to take off. A tiny number of very wealthy passengers were choosing to travel by air and enjoy the height of luxury. Most popular of all the civil airliners was the Douglas DC-3. When war came, these planes were turned over to Uncle Sam. DC-3s became C-47s overnight. Known as the Dakota to the British, or the Goonie Bird to the Americans. The C-47 became the workhorse of the skies, carrying men and materiel from one war zone to another. They also carried paratroopers, like the men who jumped behind enemy lines the night before D-Day to launch the Allied invasion of Europe. Before the war, the orthodoxy had been that the bomber will always get through. And during the Second World War, some formidable bombers took to the skies. The B-26 Marauder was known by some very unflattering nicknames, such as the Widowmaker, with no visible means of support. But when the crews were properly trained to fly it, it became a universal hit. And the Marauder flew bombing missions on most fronts of World War II. The Boeing B-17 was called the Flying Fortress because it had so many guns to defend itself, it resembled a fortress. Thousands of these mighty aircraft were built and flown from England to bomb the enemy's homeland. But losses were still severe, and many B-17s came back from a mission whole with its crew badly mauled. The British Lancaster flew by night and needed less armor, so it could carry a far heavier bomb load. The giant 10-ton bomb it carried contained the biggest destructive force in any bomb before the atomic age. The thousand bomber raids on Germany pounded the heart of the Nazi war machine into rubble. But although the bomber so often did get through, another invention, the story of which is told in a Battle Stations episode, helped to limit its effectiveness. The advent of radar meant that approaching aircraft could be seen and carefully tracked. This enabled the RAF to use its precious fighter reserves to great effect during the Battle of Britain. Slowly, the balance began to turn against the bomber. In the post-war world, the giant eight-engined B-52 bomber took on a variety of roles. During the Cold War, it carried nuclear weapons. 
In Vietnam, it carried up to 70,000 pounds of conventional bombs. In the war against terror, the B-52 still strikes dread into the hearts of the enemy. The vapor trails of an approaching B-52 can be a sign that Uncle Sam is about to punch his way into your day. But on radar screens, the B-52 has a large and very visible radar cross-section. By the 1970s, the quest was on to find a new form of technology that could not be picked up by radar, stealth. It seemed an impossible quest to produce an invisible plane. But again, the most brilliant scientists and engineers working out of Lockheed Skunk Works came up with a solution. The F-117 Nighthawk has a tiny radar cross-section. It is designed to be as close as possible to the shape of a diamond, so its angles deflect radar beams. And when coated with anti-static paint, the F-117 can often pass unnoticed by the enemy's radar. That's why the F-117 is often used by the US to launch the first blow, to blind the enemy by hitting his radar and communication centers in the first strike of a conflict. And that's exactly what it did over the heavily defended airspace over Baghdad in March 2003, all recorded and told in an episode of Battle Stations. So the series has recorded the extraordinary advances in a century of flight. But Battle Stations also tells the story of how technology has impacted on the battlefield. The first tanks trundled slowly across the barbed wire of no man's land in 1916. But by 1939, they were used to spearhead a new technique of a fast-moving lightning war. The Soviets were the first to design a tank that, due to the angle of its armor, simply deflected most of the enemy's shells. It was a triumph of design, and when more than 50,000 T-34s were produced, the tank helped to change the course of the Second World War. When America came into the war, its car factories helped to build tanks. And in Detroit, huge production lines were created to build tens of thousands of M4 Shermans. They became the universal Allied tank of World War II, familiar on every battlefield where Americans fought. Far more formidable was the 62-ton German Tiger tank. Ferdinand Porsche and Adolf Hitler both had a say in its design. It was probably the most feared tank of the war. Its 88-millimeter gun outclassed every other tank. And whilst it could penetrate the armor of a Sherman at 3,000 yards, a Sherman couldn't even penetrate its heavy armor at 300 yards. Big and powerful, it was well suited to the German ideal of the super weapon. But it was also heavy, slow, and prone to mechanical failures. And there were only very few Tiger tanks built, fortunately for the Allies.
tank design continued to develop after the war. And in the 1980s, the Americans came up with the M1 Abrams as their main battle tank. It combines heavy armor with ferocious and accurate firepower from its 120 mm gun, whilst also being able to travel at speed. Armor, firepower, and mobility. The Abrams has it all. Is it the last in the line of heavy battle tanks? Episodes of Battle Stations tell the stories of the T-34, the Sherman, the Tiger, and the Abrams, to show how the face of the battlefield has been transformed by the tank. And on the high seas, the last century has also witnessed dramatic change. In the run-up to the First World War, there was a race between Britain and Germany to build ever larger Dreadnought-class battleships. But these huge vessels would soon become the dinosaurs of the oceans. Aircraft would change naval warfare forever. Planes could hit a target well beyond the range of even the biggest naval guns. And a single aircraft or a submarine could sink the biggest battleship. After Pearl Harbor, America needed aircraft carriers and lots of them. So the naval designers came up with the Essex-class aircraft carrier. Easy to build and able to carry nearly a hundred aircraft. Tens of thousands of men and women built them in giant shipyards. Twenty-four of these giant floating cities were built before the war was over. No naval battle in the Pacific was complete without them. But despite their size and the punch they packed, they were still vulnerable to the kamikaze, Japanese suicide pilots. Although not a single Essex-class carrier was sunk by kamikaze attack, one hit from a suicide pilot could ignite fires and explosions that would kill many and put a carrier out of action for months. At the other end of the scale, the small Fletcher-class destroyers were never far from the heart of the action and again helped to bring victory at sea in the Pacific and elsewhere. Then there were the heavy battle cruisers like HMS Belfast, who played the key role in pursuing and finally sinking the Scharnhorst in the icy waters off the North Cape. The Scharnhorst had been creating havoc with the Russian convoys, but it was finally hunted down by the Royal Navy, and the heavy six-inch guns of the Belfast helped bring about its end. Then, to answer the need for literally thousands of ships to carry cargoes from one theater of war to another, there were the Liberty ships. Again, a triumph of design. They were prefabricated and were made in parts all across America and then assembled in coastal shipyards. They played a vital but undramatic role in the war. But for the sailors on board, once they'd left their port, they regarded themselves as in enemy waters. Many Liberty ships were sent to the bottom whilst carrying the materials that would help to bring victory. Battle Stations episodes feature the Essex-class aircraft carriers, the Fletcher-class destroyers, tell the story of HMS Belfast, and of the heroism of the sailors who crossed every ocean in the Liberty ships.
but technology sometimes comes up with some wonderful hybrids. Is it a truck or is it a boat? It's both. The DUKW, known as the Duck, was designed to fulfill a specific need, to get men, supplies and ammunition ashore from the sea onto the land without having to offload everything at the sea's edge. And for D-Day, the British designed and built in total secret huge floating harbors that were constructed in sections and then floated across the channel to Normandy. When they arrived, these caissons, huge concrete and steel casements, were sunk to form a giant breakwater. Then, from the pier heads, long flexible pontoons carried men and machines to the beach. Within five months of D-Day, more than two million men and several million tons of supplies had been brought ashore across these temporary harbors known as mulberries. Battle station episodes tell the story of the duck and of the mulberry harbors. Strange, unusual looking objects, but just like the Spitfire or the Tiger tank, they played a key role in solving a battlefield problem. That's what Battle Stations is about, how technology can help to change the shape of battle. But every fighting machine needs men to operate it, to fly it or to drive it. And those men feature in Battle Stations telling their stories. This really is the story of how wars are won.